Welcome to week seven of our 10 times better series where we're going through the 10 commandments. And can you put your hand up now if we, now that we are on week seven, if you could confidently list all 10 of the 10 commandments. Wow. I feel like this is even less than the very first week that we started this series, but that's okay. That's fine. Opportunities for growth. The most important thing is, church, that you know that the Ten Commandments is not a a set of rules to take away all our fun and our pleasure, but they are boundaries that lead to blessing. They are boundaries that lead to blessing. And I want you to think of the Ten Commandments just like that. God ordained boundaries that lead to blessing in our lives. And I want to give you a really quick brief background because I know people have come in here from all walks of life. Some of you don't know what the Ten Commandments are. And... uh, I did mention this when I preached on honoring your mother and father, but I think this will be just helpful to touch on. Basically, God's people have been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. And Moses comes to Pharaoh and he says, let my people go. And there's a whole event about that. And they eventually are let go and they they travel through the Red Sea and they enter the wilderness. Then God presses pause and God says, before you enter the promised land, I need to give you some tools to enable you to be successful in the promised land. And Moses goes up the mountain, spends time with God, and God gives the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments are not obsolete, they are absolute. They are not obsolete, they are absolute. They are something that we need in our life today to connect with today. And you would have heard it said many times, Christianity is not about rules, it's about relationship with Jesus, and that is 100% correct. It is about relationship with Jesus. But every healthy relationship has some boundaries that keeps it healthy. Myself and Pastor Terrence would be married for 16 and a half years. <laughs> I had to think for a second there, but I got it right. And 15 of them were great. You'll hear about the first year when we do the relationship series. The 16 and a half years and our, what keeps our relationship healthy is some boundaries that we have in place. So, for example, you know, I can't come home and say, hey, Terrence, nice to see you. Hey, I'm going to go hang out with John tonight. I'll be back tomorrow morning. That wouldn't go down well. Every healthy relationship has boundaries that keep the relationship healthy. Think of the, it like traffic laws. They actually do exist, South Floridians. Surprise, surprise. And they are not to create a prison for our lives, but protection for our lives. A blessed life actually thrives and enjoys the boundaries that God gives us to live in. 1 John 5, 3 says, in fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. They are not burdensome. They're going to give you freedom and they're going to give you joy. Amen? Amen. So there is a principle behind each of these commandments, and each week we've been focusing on the principle behind the commandment, and uh, the principle that we're going to look at today is honesty. Commandment number nine, Exodus 20, 16 is where we find it. This is the King James Version. It says, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. And I want to speak to you this morning from this topic, quit capping, be honest. Quit capping, be honest. And here is why it matters. Before we dive into this this morning, this is why you need to lean in, because lies keep us in bondage. Jesus went to the cross so that we could be free. Galatians 5.1 is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He went through a whole lot so that you could be free. Truth brings trust. Truth brings intimacy. Truth brings freedom. Lies keep us in bondage. And God hates lies. Strong statement. But we read it time and time again in Revelations 21.8. He lists like nine or so things. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, put your crystals away, people. You are summoning demons, the idolaters, and all liars. They will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Again, in Proverbs, we read it like this. Proverbs 6, 18. A heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush to evil. A false witness. A false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the community. Church is a community. And the reason why he hates it so much is because it is the opposite of who he is. Jesus 
is truth. And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. The reason truth is so important to God is because truthfulness is part of God's nature. It's who he is. Titus 1-2, God who does not lie. Jesus is truth. And it's fascinating what Jesus has to say about the devil in John 8:44. It says, you belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to what? Truth. truth. For there is no truth. There is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Jesus makes the point that the devil not only speaks lies, but he spreads lies. God's Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So when we speak truth, we align ourselves with God and God's Holy Spirit. When we speak lies, we align ourselves with who? Jesus said in John 8, 32, then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And this is why it matters so much. Because if the truth sets you free, then lies will keep you bound. And nobody wants to live a life like that. So let's break this down. Exodus 20, 16, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now this has been shortened many times to don't lie. And that's okay, because it's true and it's relevant. But let me explain the King James language, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. When God wrote and delivered this to Moses, your neighbor in scripture was not the person that lived next to you or beside you. It was any person that you came in contact with. And we know this because Jesus said, love your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then everyone around him said, well, who's your neighbor? And he told the story of the Good Samaritan. So he teaches us that your neighbor is anyone that you come in contact with. It's everyone. And God was establishing a society that was governed by moral law. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor. This was actually a legal commandment. He's saying, don't purge yourself. Bear means to testify. When you're asked a question, false means a lie. And witness means your testimony. When you're asked a question, don't lie. And we need to understand that God was trying to set up a society where they could love him and love each other well. And this is actually where we get the saying from, which is still said in court today. They have you put your hand on the Bible and I, what do they say? I swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. This statement actually traces back to this commandment. So how were disputes settled at the time in that day and that age? How would you know? There's no DNA. There's no cameras. We have cameras on the inside of our house, some cameras. And I think initially they were meant to be for security, but honestly, we've never used them for that. The only time I look at the cameras is to find out which one of my four kids is lying. And they know because they will say, that's not true. He did it. That's not true. She did it. Check, check the cameras. Check the cameras. That is the only time I am looking at these cameras. <laughs> but how would they know how to settle a case back then? No dear, no, no cameras. It was all someone's witness. It was all someone's testimony. So this was serious. And it was even more serious because Israel was a capital punishment society. If you lie... You could commit murder. If the person dies because of your witness and then it's found out that you lied, you're next. And if a person was to be stoned to death, which was a common way to end someone's life, the witness cast the first stone. So you better be right. So if you were going to witness that someone was guilty, you better be right. And these kind of intense, uh, intense punishments for lying are actually prevalent all throughout history. In ancient Greece, if you lied on the stand, you were given a stiff penalty, but if you did it a second time, you lost all your civil rights. In Egypt, if you lied on the stand, they amputated your ears and your nose. So it was easy to tell who the liars were, I guess. There's some interesting history for you. But the principle behind the commandment is honesty. And I think today we live in a world of truth decay, shall we call it. James 3, 5 says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. 
Even though a small body part, the tongue can do enormous damage. It was the same then as it is now. And I'm sure even now as I'm saying this, many of you are thinking about things that people have said about you that aren't true and the enormous pain that it has caused, the broken relationships, the lost jobs. And the thing is, even if that person is repentant and they go back and they're like, I'm going to fix it, I'm going to tell them what I said wasn't exactly true, it's often so hard to correct these things because that person has already told that person who's already told that person who's already told that person. But the good news is that Jesus can fix the sting of pain in your heart that it has caused. And I do believe that he is going to do that today for many of you here in the room. But before we go there, I want to break this down today. I think the Bible instructs us to do three things based on this commandment. We say here, note takers are history makers, so take some notes. God calls us to do three things. The first thing is be honest with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with ourselves about perhaps some habits that we've picked up along the way some coping mechanisms. <laughs> some of these could have been ingrained in our lives from childhood. Perhaps no one ever listened to you growing up, so you created this habit of exaggerating just to try and be heard. But now that you're an adult, you're still doing it. But if you could trace it back to the root issue where it took place and allowed God to heal that thing, it would then heal all the symptoms that you now walk in as an adult. You still exaggerate. And why does it matter? Why is it important not to exaggerate? Let me explain it to you. If something is 99% true, it is still 100% false. It doesn't matter how close to the truth it is, it's actually not true. If I'm going to get my blood work done, I want someone who 100% of the time has not killed someone while taking their blood. If I'm going to get my taxes done from a tax professional, I want someone who 100% of the time has not made a mistake that has sent someone to jail. That's why it's important not to exaggerate because if something is 99% true, it's 100% false. So we've got to be honest with ourselves. Everything that comes out of our mouth comes from the heart. Luke 6.45 says, A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So we've got to be honest with ourselves and pray as David prayed in Psalm 139. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is an offensive way in me. I tell our worship team to pray this prayer in their quiet time with God. I pray this prayer in my time with God. God, search my heart. Reveal to me if there is anything that is not of you. It's a powerful prayer and we should all be praying it every day. Because the hardest people to help as a pastor are dishonest people. I can't help them because they're not honest with themselves. They're just dishonest. I can't help them because it's never their fault. It's never anything they did. They've always got an excuse. And we can't change what we won't acknowledge. Being honest with ourselves takes immense vulnerability and it's scary. I get it. But at some point in your life, if you want to grow, you're going to have to allow yourself to be vulnerable and say, you know what? I possibly could have picked up some bad habits in this thing called life. And the challenge is some people are so hurt and wounded by their past that They've built these walls of dishonesty as a coping mechanism. But if you can't be honest about mistakes, you'll never get free. It's the disease of BSE, blame somebody else. <laughs> Do you suffer from BSE? It started in the garden. Adam was like, well, it was Eve. It was her. Eve was like, it was the, it was the serpent. BSE. Welcome to Adulting 101. It's fun here, I promise. You're going to learn something today. So be honest with yourself. How do I do that, you might ask? Psalm 139. You know, David prayed this prayer, search my heart. He prayed this prayer after he made a huge mistake. After Bathsheba, after he had Bathsheba's husband killed. He was like, oh my gosh. He realized that he'd made some heavy mistakes. He's got, God, search my heart. Be vulnerable enough to ask God, to search your heart and whatever he reveals to you, give it to him. Surrender it to him. Ask him to heal it. 
He is more than capable to heal whatever that thing is for you. He wants you healed more than you want to be healed. Amen? So be honest with ourselves is number one. The second thing that God asks us to be is be honest with others. Be honest with others. And in this point of being honest with others, I just want to highlight three things that the Bible really clearly warns us against. Three types of false testimony. The first one is gossip. In Ephesians 4.29, it says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. What is gossip? Gossip is hearing something you like about somebody you don't. It's the speedy transition of near factual information. And it isn't so much the stuff that goes in one ear, out the other, that hurts. It's the stuff that goes in one ear, gets all mixed up in the middle, and then comes out of someone's mouth. What's the juicy gossip? What's the tea? I have a high repellent to people who gossip, maybe because I'm a pastor's kid, and maybe I've got to talk to my therapist about it, but I have a high aversion to people who gossip because I've seen the pain that it has caused. And the older I've gotten, actually, the less tolerant I've become. Even our team will tell you, some of them have started a sentence with, hey, I better not tell you this, but I shouldn't tell you this, but, and I'm like, you know what, you shouldn't. Have a great day. If you don't think you should, you shouldn't. I've just seen the pain and hurt caused by spreading untruths about people. And often it's the slightly distorted truth. It's the slightly distorted truth. And that's, how the, that's what the devil did as well, you know. He incorporated just a little bit of truth so it would be confusing enough that people would believe it. The Bible warns us against gossip. And we might think it's a light topic to mention, but it causes incredible hurt to people. And I want to clarify this. The Ninth Commandment, isn't so much about censorship, but more about how to build a community that has discretion, respect, and mutual caring. In any community of people, there's bound to be situations, and it, it, there's, you do need to speak up in certain situations, especially if an injustice is being done. But the key is this, and we have it in the Bible so clearly, Ephesians 4:15, to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. So the Bible warns us about gossip. The second thing that the Bible warns us about is slander. James 4.11, brothers and sisters, do not slander one another. Slander is malicious untruth with intention of causing harm. We can ruin someone's reputation with one word, and that word is but. He's a great guy, but... He, he just, she's a good girl, but, uh, but what? It's insinuation. It's like, if you only knew what I knew, what do you know? <laughs> insinuation is when you make a statement that leads people to think something that is not true, to encourage them to jump to the wrong conclusion. We provide the building blocks and let someone else construct the lie themselves. In Shakespeare's famous play, Otello, it's, it's a story about a jealous husband who believes the slanderous rumors that his wife is having an affair, and in a fit of rage, he murders her, only to find out afterwards that it was all a complete lie. But these kind of things play out in life today, over and over. And the Bible warns us against gossip, against slander. The third thing the Bible warns us against is flattery. Flattery is saying something to a person's face that we would never say behind their back. Flattery is insincere praise. We compliment somebody, but we don't mean it. It's like an artificial sweetener. Proverbs 26, 28, flattering words cause ruin. 
And I honestly didn't really understand what flattery was because I am an encourager by nature and I married the ultimate encourager, but he encourages everyone to their face and behind the scenes. He will talk to a whole room about someone who's not there and tell the whole room how amazing they are. So I actually had not experienced flattery, but then I had someone in my world who was very full of compliments to me, but my discernment meter is high and I was like, something is off. And I prayed a prayer that you need to be careful if you pray this, just prepare your heart because God may answer. And I actually asked God, could you just reveal, bring it to light. Something's off. Reveal it. And it was flattery. The Bible warns against gossip, slander, and flattery. So be honest with others. So how do we guard against it? I'm going to tell you. Don't be afraid to cut conversations off. Now, I don't know who John is. I'm sorry if your name is John. I know you. that was the name of the ex first example we spent the night together. But listen, if your name's John, you're doing good. But I've heard Pastor Terrence say many times, if someone has tried to say something to him, he's like, that's just not the John I know. That's just not my experience with John. That hasn't been my experience with John. If anyone starts a sentence with people are saying... People are saying, okay, who? If they can't tell you who said it and you can't resolve it because they won't be clear, then why are you digesting it? Yeah. It's not high school. People are saying it's you and your mom. This is a manipulative tactic to get their agenda across. This is going to help some of you. We got to be honest. Just talk straight and be honest. Why should we be honest with others? We read this again in James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Why? So that you may be healed. Why does it have to say that? Why can't it say, just confess to God, whisper it under your breath, make sure no one hears about it. Like, we say it all the time. Get yourself in a group here at History Makers Church because healing is found in the context of community. Healing is found in the context of community. And I shared a, a few weeks ago at our daughter's conference, I was sharing a story how in Australia, before we left Australia, in Australia I worked in television and radio and media and I also would speak at a lot of different churches and, and women's conferences. And as I traveled around, I would share my story, but I would only share bits. I wouldn't share all of the things that I share now. And part of that is because I did work in media, my story would be a tabloid, not a testimony. And as we started to prepare to move here, the Holy Spirit started to prepare my heart to share more of my story. Because I would share a lot of this stuff that had happened to me that God had restored, but there was a lot of stuff that I had done <laughs> that God also restored. And there's many people that need to hear about that because they are sitting in shame, not understanding that he is the God that redeems absolutely everything. You come to him with a repentant heart. He redeems, he restores, makes new. His word says his, your sins are as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. It's only you that's remembering them. <laughs> he doesn't even remember them. Every time you go to tell him why you should be disqualified, it's the first time he's hearing it. So the Holy Spirit started to prompt me to share um, more and more of my story. It's like he was preparing me for what he was asking me to do here. And um, I worked in television and he, he highlighted a, a producer on a TV show I worked on. He told me to sit down with her and he said, share your whole story with her. Now, if you've been here for a little while, you would have heard me talk about radical obedience. Listen, radical obedience to the whispers of God is going to be your key to fulfilling your purpose and destiny. You need to be obedient when he tells you to go, you go. When he tells you to stay, you stay. So I sat down with her and I thought, this woman is going to think I'm absolutely crazy. And I said, I knew she had a relationship with Jesus. I, I didn't really know where she was at, but I was like, hey, I feel like God's prompted me to, to tell you my whole story. So I don't know why, but I'm just going to tell you. And I started to tell her my whole story. And by the end of it, she is standing there or sitting there. We're in a cafe and she's crying and crying and crying. And she looked at me and she said, your story is the same as my story, but I have never told a soul. Not even my husband knows. And then unprompted, she started to tell her story. 
for the very first time in her entire life. And as we sat in that cafe, and as I sat across from her, there was a third person at the table, and it was Jesus. He was sitting there, and his healing balm, as, she, as things became unlocked because she brought them into the light. The devil has a field day when everything is in the dark. Every place light enters, darkness has no choice but to flee. And as she brought those things into the light in a safe place, because listen, it's safe. <laughs> Been there, done that, girlfriend. Let me tell you how Jesus can heal you. <laughs> Between me and the Holy Spirit, she encountered a supernatural healing. A supernatural healing. There is power when you are honest with others. Start getting honest with people. You don't have to be two people anymore. <laughs> Be honest with your husband, with your wife. Tell them, listen, I'm really struggling with this. Talk to your group leader. That's what they're for. Tell them. Lies only provide short-term benefits but end up with long-term consequences. Be honest with others. I was counseling a couple who had infidelity in their marriage, and the rebuild could really only begin when he started to be truly honest. That was the foundation for the rebuild. Some of you think, if I am honest, it's going to knock down the last little bit that we have left, but no, it's the opposite. It's the foundation for the rebuild because they can trust your words. Anyone who has walked through infidelity will tell you the hardest thing is not the immorality, immorality it's the dishonesty be honest with others that will be the foundation for the rebuild the fabric of all healthy relationships are woven in truth when myself and pastor terence we had broken up and we were going to get back together it's a long story you can watch it later just go back on the youtube to the relationship series but what, what we actually haven't shared there is we actually did get together initially when we first met, but he broke up with me real quick. <laughs> he did the right thing. Don't worry. It was a good decision. I would have been a project because I still needed Jesus. Uh, and you deserve a partner, not a project. Okay. In case you didn't know that. This whole equally yoke thing is real. You need a partner, not a project. So um, he had broken up with me, but the reason he'd broken up with me is because I just, he'd asked me, you know, about my life and I just told him everything. I didn't hold anything back and it was all a little too much for him at the time and fair enough. And, um, and he broke up with me. So anyway, long story, fast forward like four years, five years. So we'd gotten together, broken up, I know it's probably a little complicated, but the whole point is I had gone through some, some immense healing in that time. And I had a great Christian counselor at the time and, and I was just sharing with her how scared I was of Whoever God has for me, who, whoever he is, like, what if I tell him my whole story and he's like, he rejects me. And, and, and I just had really come to this understanding, just working with her and the good Lord and his word, that the right person that God has for me will see me how Jesus sees me. Restored, redeemed, made new, new creation in Christ, everything that his word says. And I, at that time, I felt quite confident in that. And so Terence basically, he'd had this epiphany that he'd made a mistake when he'd broken up with me and he, was, he wanted to get back together and he wanted to get married. Like, I was his wife. Like, he was a little intense. But, it, <laughs> but listen, when you know, you know, right? Like, don't waste your time. We actually got married 12 weeks later. But... Oh, he said he had to get there before John did. I'm sorry, John. <laughs> sorry if your name is John. But... <laughs> But I remember sitting down with him and I knew what he was thinking. He wanted to get back together, but he wanted to get engaged. Like he wanted to get married. And I was like, okay, if this is it, I'm going to, all right, God, me and God, we had a deal. I told God, okay. Oh, I felt like God had told me, just tell your husband. I'm like, okay. So I, I sat him down like, listen, I need to tell you some things. And I honestly did not know how that conversation was going to go. I thought it might all just be too much for him and he was going to, break out with me yet again before we even technically got back together. But I was, I was okay with it because I felt like God has the right one for me. And the right man for me is going to see me how Jesus sees me. And I felt secure in that. So I'm like, oh God, I want it to be him. But if it's not him, I know you got the right one. Because I trusted God above everything else. And so I told him my whole story, sat there with, sitting on my hands, telling him my whole story, waiting for his response. 
And at the end, he goes, thanks for telling me. I'm like, is that it? He's like, yeah. Do you want to you get some lunch? He's like, oh. Jeez, like I was fasting and praying for three days, three nights. Okay, that's it. <laughs> but we had to start with honesty as the foundation to be able to build on that. I had to just be one person. This is me. This is all of me. Take it or leave it. It's up to you. I know Jesus loves me, so I'm good either way, but tell me now, because I do think you're kind of cute. Be honest with yourself. Be honest with others. And the third, be honest with God. Be honest with God. And you might say, why do I have to be honest? What do you mean be honest with God? He's God. He knows everything. He knows what I'm thinking. What do you mean be honest with God? Parents in the room, you know if you have a child, we have four children, if there is smashed glass over the floor and one of your kids are holding a ball that you told them not to bounce in the house, you know what happened. But if they are just honest with you, it builds trust, it builds intimacy, it builds a deeper level of your relationship. And I think just like that, our Father in heaven, yeah, He knows. But if you would just tell Him, just surrender some things to Him, it builds trust, it builds a deeper level of intimacy. There's a new level of intimacy that is built. He already knows, he's already paid for it all. But I think some of us won't be honest with God because we've learned to be prideful because we think we can deal with it without bringing God into it. And if you want to be free from something, you've got to bring God into it. You would have heard Pastor Terrence say, it's not, I can't tell my dad that I messed up. It's actually, I messed up. I need to tell my dad because he's going to show me how to fix it. And for me, it was finally when I got honest with God about the root issue of some stuff in my life, which was, I was really angry at God. And He knew. But I remember the moment just on my bedroom floor as a 23-year-old crying out to God, saying, you know what, God, I'm actually just really angry at you. I'm mad at you because you didn't heal my mom. Because she died when she was just 37. I was four years old. But I'm a pastor's kid. I grew up in church. So I'd seen signs, wonders, miracles, and I watched God heal other people. Supernatural miracles were very normal to me. I'd seen people get out of wheelchairs. I'd seen it. So I knew God could heal. So I'm like, God, you healed that person. They're not even a nice person. I'm so angry at you because you, you didn't heal my mom. And it was in that moment when I got honest with God that I actually experienced just being held by Him. His Word says that His ways are higher. His thoughts are higher. We won't understand everything this side of heaven. But He met me right there in the middle of my anger. My anger did not push Him away. He's not offended by your anger. He's not offended by your questions. He's not offended by your frustration. He stays. He's right there. And He just wants to hold you in the middle of it. He is in the middle of it. And I discovered then what it truly means just to be held by the Father. Even when you don't have all the answers. But I had to get honest with God. In Psalm 32, 1, it says, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. It's present tense. It's already taken care of. It's easy to be honest with God when you know that God has you. God is saying, I want you to be honest with yourself. I want you to be honest with others. And I want you to be honest with me. This is one of the most freeing principles that you could ever allow into your life. Truth is liberating. It's not confusing. Truth is liberating. It's not confusing. Be honest with yourself. That makes you whole. Be honest with others. That brings healing, healed. Be honest with God. That makes you holy. I'm going to say that again because I didn't send it to the screens. Be honest with yourself, that makes you whole. Be honest with others, you are healed. Be honest with God, that makes you holy. 
And many of us in the room have had lies told about us. And we need to encounter the truth of Jesus Christ. Many of us can still remember hurtful things that were said to us. You know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That's actually not true. It takes longer to repair a wounded spirit than a wounded bone. The fact is that many of us have been told a lot of lies and we see now a distorted image of ourselves when we look in a distorted mirror with false information, we arrive at false conclusions. But Jesus wants you to be free. He wants you to be free and he went through a whole lot so that you could be free. And his word says over and over what he says about you, the truth. And I want to give you some of these truths right now. You say, I am unlovable, but God says you are forever loved. Romans 8, 38. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ. Jesus, our Lord. You might say that you were scarred, but he calls you healed. Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. You might say, I am weak, but he says, no, I make you strong. Psalm 18, 32. God arms me with strength and he makes my way perfect. You might say, I was abandoned, but God says, no, you are adopted. Ephesians 1.5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. This is what he wanted to do. And it gives him great pleasure. It gives him great pleasure to adopt you as his son, as his daughter. You might say you are broken, but God says he has made you whole, Colossians 2.10. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority. You might say that you are rejected, but God says, no, you are his. Isaiah 43.1, do not fear, I have redeemed you, I have summoned you, you are mine. You might say, I am alone, but God says he is with you. Joshua 1.9, do not be afraid or discouraged, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You might say, I am hopeless. But God says, nah, Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. And they are not for evil. They are to give you a future and a hope. You might say, I am nothing special, but God says you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, 14, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. God speaks truth. Remember, He cannot lie. He cannot lie. And His Word is full of truth that He speaks over you. Towards the end of Jesus' life, Jesus became a, a victim of those who broke the ninth commandment, literally. And it's recorded in Mark 15, 3, the chief priest accused Jesus of many things. It says, and he answered nothing. Matthew 27, 14, but Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. And we are told over and over in Scripture to let God be our vindicator. He says in Psalm 37, 6, He will vindicate you in broad daylight and publicly defend your just cause. Wait patiently for the Lord. Wait confidently for Him. Do not fret over the apparent success of a sinner, a man who carries out wicked schemes. Do not be angry or frustrated. Do not fret. He says it twice. That only leads to trouble. He is your vindicator. And I wanted to highlight this scripture because I know there's people in the room who have had lies said about them. And you're stressing and you're striving, thinking you gotta fix it, but you don't. In fact, the more you keep your hands off that situation, the more you keep your mouth out of that conversation, the more access it gives for Jesus to intervene because his word says over and over that he is your vindicator. He will vindicate you. You just need to wait on Him. You just need to trust in Him. You know, when we came here to plant this church, there were some people that really did not want us to leave. And they said some things that were very untrue and it was very, very hurtful, but we both heard from God to not engage, not defend ourselves. So we didn't, we stayed silent, which is very hard to do. 
But God told us, I am your vindicator. I am your vindicator. Do not even enter into that ring. I am your vindicator. And as we stayed silent and the years passed, he breathed on what he asked us to do and he finished up what they were doing. We did not even need to engage. He was our vindicator. He will be your vindicator. You can be assured of that. I want to pray for three groups of people as we come to a close this morning. Three very specific groups of people. Some of you, the first group, you're living and you're believing lies about yourself and it's bound you for years and you need to be set free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You will know the truth which is Jesus and the truth will set you free. There's another group of people here. You have actually been perpetuating lies and you need to repent. But your, you repenting will be the beginning of your transformation. The beginning of honesty is the confession of dishonesty. And that is going to be the foundation for you to rebuild. And God is going to restore and redeem. He, he can do anything with a repentant heart. You just bring it to him. He's going to help you. He's going to grow you. And the third group, I think there's a third group of people here who have been really hurt by people's lies spoken against them. It's caused a deep wound. And I believe that God is going to heal it for you here today. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you all to stand to your feet. And if you're one of those three groups of people, would you make your way to the front? Our ministry team is here. We're going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you specifically, but then we're going to worship and our ministry team is going to pray for you. Any of those three groups of people, we don't even need to know which group you're in. Don't worry. You just come down the front. This is between you and God. Okay. This is between you and God. As they make their way down, we never want to finish a service without giving you an opportunity to invite Jesus into your life because you can't do this without him. His word says, it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And I think some of you have been trying to do this in your own strength, but you can't. This is the Jesus thing. This is the power of the Holy Spirit at work. It's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So what we're going to do is we're going to give you an opportunity. If you've never invited Jesus into your life, we're going to pray a prayer with you. And you can invite Jesus into your life. His word says in Romans, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, you will be saved. So just to respect the privacy of those around you, and you can keep making your way to the front, would you just bow your head and close your eyes? And if that's you here today, if that's you here and you want to invite Jesus into your heart, maybe you used to be in relationship with Him and you walked away. Today is the day to reconnect with Him. He is a loving Father and He's just waiting patiently. It doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been. He is right there waiting for you with loving arms. So if that's you here today, just to respect the privacy of those around us, if you would just bow your head, close your eyes. If that's you and you want me to pray that prayer with you, just raise your hand and say, that's me, Emma. That's me. That's me. Thank you. I see your hand. That's me. I want to invite Jesus into my heart today. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand. Thank you. I see your hand. Let's pray this together. Everyone say, Dear Jesus, I invite you into my heart. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I commit today to follow you all the days of my life. I declare today that I am saved. Would you lift him up a shout of praise in this house? Heaven is celebrating. Heaven is celebrating. Amen. 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 We are celebrating with you and we want to walk this journey together. And if you prayed that prayer or you want to know more about Jesus, follow the prompts that are on the screen right now. Our vision is God's vision for you and that's to see you live a better story, holy, healthy, happy and bringing heaven to earth. And if you've been impacted by what you hear, partner with us. Yeah, together we can make both an epic and an eternal difference. The giving options are coming up on the screen to share the love and see people meet Jesus and live that better story.
Hey, and if you're in the South Florida area, we would love to see you in person. Check out the description below for times and places where we can meet and we'd love to see you soon. Yes, where friends become family at History Makers Church.